Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Molly Richardson. I am the BITS Data Systems Coordinator, as Whitney mentioned. And today I'll be talking about the targeted runoff management and notice of discharge grant modules in BITS. Um, also, as Whitney mentioned, with us today are Joanna Griffin and Kareen Johnson, who are two uh, more program contacts from the DNR who will be helping with the question and answer session. Um, so you might hear from them when we get to the Q&A breaks. So today I will be talking through uh, this agenda. So we'll start with some background on BITS, what it is and why we need to use it. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and go into a walkthrough of using the TRIM and NOD modules in BITS. After the walkthrough, we'll have some time for questions. And then I will talk about the shapefile upload process, which is an optional process that lets you upload spatial data into BITS using a shapefile. Then I'll cover some frequently asked questions and leave you with some resources to um, help if you need additional assistance. And then finally, we'll conclude with another question and answer session at the end. So to get started, uh, first a little bit of background on the BITS system. So for those of you who don't know what BITS is or might not know what it stands for, BITS is the BMP Implementation Tracking System, which is an online tool that the DNR created for submitting BMP data or best management practice data uh, for a, a certain set of non-point source pollution reduction programs. Um, so today we have three modules available in BITS, uh, the Multiple Discharge or Variance Module, or MDV, and then the two modules we'll be talking about today, which are the Targeted Runoff Management Final Report Module and the Notice of Discharge Final Report Module. In the future, we also plan to include further modules for additional uh, pollution reduction programs. One of the next uh, set of modules on our list is uh, the Urban Nonpoint Source Grant Modules. We are also planning to add an NR151 Compliance Tracking Module and hopefully many more modules as well as time and funding allows, such as uh, TMDL tracking, potentially uh, water quality trading and so on. Also planned for future inclusion in BITS are additional pieces of functionality, such as reporting tools for uh, users like yourselves and members of the public to see what uh, practices are implemented through these programs, as well as a spatial data viewer that is available to the public to see on a map uh, where these programs are being implemented. So why do we have BITS and why do we want to start using it? Well, we have four goals of the BITS system. First, uh, BITS facilitates an easy and efficient submission of information for the non-point source programs contained within it. Uh, BITS takes the place of paper or PDF forms that had previously been used to submit some of this data. Secondly, BITS allows for GIS-based spatial data submission and eventually analysis. Uh, so uh, in addition to the ability to submit your um, quantitative data for these practices, uh, BITS also allows you to submit spatial components as well. Third, BITS uh, allows for increased transparency around how these funds are being used. So as I mentioned, as we have these reporting tools become available, uh, stakeholders, members of the public will be able to see how these funds are being used across the state. And then finally, BITS will allow for the development of tracking tools for progress towards statewide nutrient reduction goals, such as TMDLs. So TREM and NOD uh, in BITS, the modules are specifically for the TRIM and NOD grant programs and the submission of the final reports within those programs. Previously, the final reports for these programs are submitted using uh, the form that you see on the screen here, that the number you see on the screen. So BITS is taking the place of that PDF form. Note that the application and reimbursement processes for the TRIM and NOD grant programs are still separate from BITS. So BITS is uh, the final report uh, only, the, the rest of these programs are still uh, using the previous methods of uh, submission. The targeted runoff management grant uh, module in BITS was released this year on March 1st. So starting on March 1st, TRIM grant final reports must be submitted using BITS rather than the PDF form. The notice of discharge grant module was released a little bit uh, later this year, uh, just last month. So starting August 19th, uh, those of you with NOD grants had the option to start using BITS for the submission of final reports. However, uh, the requirement to use BITS for NOD final reports uh, will take place starting on November 1st. So for those of you who have an active NOD grant, right now you have an option to either submit the final report using the historical PDF form or using BITS. 
All right, so with some of that background out of the way, uh, I'll go ahead and jump into a walkthrough. So before I get into the system itself, I want to take a couple minutes to talk about who should be going through the system to document your project. So uh, when you have a TRIM or NOD grant, you'll have a project contact or a staff member at your organization who's most directly involved in the implementation of that grant project. Most likely, that's going to be the person who is using BITS. Um, if that isn't the case, if you happen to have someone else who will be doing the data entry for your project, um, that's okay. They'll just be a separate data entry contact, but they should have an understanding of the project as well so that they can accurately document the data. Note that the person who creates the project in bits will be the only person who can edit it. So you'll wanna make sure that if there is a project contact who will need to edit the project in the future, they're probably gonna be the one who uh, is gonna to wanna to create the project in bits. So how do you access bits if you've never been there before? Well, the first thing you need to do is create a WAMS ID if you don't have one, and then request access to bits itself. There is an instruction document that I've linked on these slides, and I'll make these slides available after the presentation, so you'll have that link. Uh, but essentially, you'll need to create an ID uh, in the WAMS ID system and then ask me for permission to edit uh, projects in bits, and I can grant that to you. And then once you have access, you'll log into the system at the URL that you see here. Um, note that for today's demo, which I'll hop to in a second, I'm actually going to be using a test website. So the URL you see on the screen today will be a little bit different. Um, but this, this login here is the one that will take you to the BITS website. So now I'm going to go ahead and hop into the system here. Let's see if I can pull this up. All right. So you should be seeing on the screen the BITS homepage. And when you go to create a project, the first thing you'll do is go over to this create a new non-point source BMP project dropdown and select your type of project. For today, I'm gonna select a trim project as our example, um, but the trim module is very similar to NOD and I'll be pointing out the places where um, trim and NOD differ. So you'll get a good understanding of both. So I'll go ahead and click on trim and then the add trim project window appears. You'll create one project in bits per grant that you have. So this project will represent the, um, the entire trim grant that you have been granted. So the project name uh, should be something descriptive enough to identify your project in a list if you have multiple projects. Um, so for this example, I'm going to be um, using a, a fictional county, Sand County, and I'm just going to say this is the Sand County Trim 2020 project. You'll enter the start date uh, when you received your trim funding and the end date of your trim grant. The grantee should be the governmental unit name which received the grant. So in this case, it'll be the Sand County Land and Water Conservation Department. The project contact will be the government staff who's most directly involved in the project, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so for today's demonstration, I will be the project contact. The authorized signatory should be the individual who is authorized to sign the final report on behalf of the governmental unit. Um, so that might be you if you happen to play both roles, or it could be another individual. So for today's demonstration, um, this is going to be someone else in the county um, named Margaret Schultz. The data entry contact and data affiliation uh, fields here at the bottom, you shouldn't have to change. Those are based on who's logged in. So you can just leave those and go ahead and click add to create your project. So once you've created your project, you'll be on the uh, main project page. And the first thing you'll do here is add the grant details. So over here on the left-hand side, there's a menu item called grant details. You'll click the add button. And here is where you select your grant type and enter your grant number. For trim grants, there are a few different options. You should know what type of grant you have based on your grant agreement. So you'll just select the option that applies to you. In this case, we'll be using a small scale non TMDL trim grant. Uh, for NOD, you don't need to select your grant type because there's only one type of NOD grant. And then the grant number will be the number on your grant agreement. So I'll just enter a number here. And the uh, the rest of this information is populated based on what you entered in the add project screen. So then you can click add and you've finished entering your grant details. 
Now we get into the main part of your project documentation, which is adding practices to your project. So to add a practice, you'll go ahead and go over to this menu item called practice over here and click add. And that'll take you to the add practice screen. So there's two ways to add a practice on this screen. You can click on the map on the location of your practice here, or you can upload a shapefile using this upload shapefile zip button. I'll get back to this shapefile zip upload um, in a later section of today's presentation. So for now, I'll be using the uh, map clicking method. So uh, I'll go ahead and zoom to the location of our practice. You can zoom by, I'm just using the scroll wheel on my mouse. You can also use these plus or minus buttons to, to scroll and you can pan by clicking on the map. Uh, just scroll in and click on the location of our practice here. Now this is not where you actually need to draw the spatial extents of your practice. That comes in a later step. Uh, when you click on the map, th that just puts a point on the map saying that I have a practice to document here. So once you click, the add practice screen will appear. And here you'll fill out some basic information about this practice. So first you'll enter the cost share agreement number for the site where this practice was located and the name of the cost share recipient. You'll enter the animal units at this site if applicable. And then notice that the Huck 12 or sub watershed name is populated for you already based on where you clicked on the map. So bits can pull that in automatically for you. Next, you'll select the BMP type from this list. So this is the list of BMPs that you can implement through the TRIM grant program. Uh, for today, I will document a cover crop and then optionally, you can give the practice a name. So the practice name field is useful if you're going to have multiple practices of the same type at the same site. For instance, if I had multiple cover crops at this site, I might decide to give this practice the name of um, Northwest Field Cover Crop, for example. Uh, if you don't supply a name, then the system will just generate a name for you. The quantity field should be populated based on the units that are automatically assigned from the BMP type that you choose. So in the case of a cover crop, the units are in acres, so you'll enter the quantity in acres. In this case, the field will be 10 acres that we planted the cover crops. And then the total cost field should be the total financial cost of implementing the practice, not just the cost share amount or the grant amount. So in this case, just a nice even number for demonstration purposes, we'll enter $1,000. And the date installer completed should just be the date that the practice was um, implemented or construction was completed, depending on the type of project. So I'll just say this was October 1st. And then the BMP notes field is optional, but it allows you to add any additional information you might want to add about this practice. So uh, for example, I'll just say that this was winter wheat that was planted on the field. So then uh, you click add and that will add the practice to your list of practices for this project. So now you can see that this uh, practice has been added to the table here on the uh, right, excuse me. You can add as many practices as you need on this screen. So I could click on the map again to add another practice. I could even upload a shape file uh, if I wanted to. Uh, but for now, I will just uh, stick with one practice and I'll go ahead and click finished adding practices to head back to my main project page. So now we'll see that the practices you added, in this case, just one, are appearing in this practices tab. Um, and there's a table here of all the practices that we've added. And the status of the practice indicates that there are multiple activities that we need to perform in order to complete the documentation. So if you click on the practice in the table, you'll see that the buttons above the table become active. And that's how we complete the rest of this documentation. So we'll start with the draw button. And that will take you to the draw screen. So on this page, this is where you're going to document the spatial extents of your practice. So uh, it's important to note that you'll want to use Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge for the draw activity. If you want to use a different browser for the rest of this um, project, that's fine. But unfortunately, the draw activity works best in Internet Explorer. Um, it can be a little bit weird if you use uh, Chrome or Firefox. So definitely recommend using Internet Explorer here. And uh, another thing to note is you can change the type of map that is displayed by clicking on this drop down here at the top. I'm going to select satellite imagery because that's going to make it easier to draw my field here. And then you'll go ahead and select your drawing tool and draw the practice on the map. 
the type of tool you use is going to depend on the type of uh, practice that you're drawing. So in the case of a cover crop BMP, uh, since this is measured in acres, we'll want to use a polygon to represent those acres. If you have a practice that's measured in feet, like um, uh, livestock fencing, for example, you'll probably use a line. Um, and then there are some practices that are documented as points, such as uh, manure storage units. So I will select polygon here. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and scroll to a field first. And then I'm going to select the polygon option. And it's pretty easy to use. It kind of tells you how to use it. You just click on each of the vertexes of your polygon to draw. So I'm just outlining the screen here, or excuse me, the field. And then you'll double click on your last vertex to complete the shape. So once you're done drawing, you want to make sure to click the Save button here at the top in order to save the spatial data to the spatial database. And then uh, once you've clicked Save, and the, the map will load again showing this, this uh, shape that you've just saved, you can click this blue Back button to go back to your project page. And also, you'll see on the map here on the bottom uh, that the shape we just drew is showing up on the map. So if you had multiple practices and you drew the shapes for each practice, then all of those shapes would uh, show up on this map after you complete the draw activity for each practice. All right, next we're going to enter uh, pollutant load reduction information, which is done on the models activity. So I'll go ahead and click my practice again to activate these buttons and then click the models button above the table. So here is where you're going to fill out the pollutant load reductions that have been calculated for your practice. So in this case, uh, you'll want to, well, for every case, you'll want to select the model that was used to estimate the pollutant load. In our case, we'll use SNAP Plus uh, for phosphorus and say that we estimated a reduction of 10 pounds per year. Um, we'll say we also use SNAP Plus for the nitrogen reduction. And if there is a pollutant that was not modeled or is not going to be affected by this um, BMP, then you can select NA as the model type. And if you select NA, then you don't have to enter an amount. <coughs> Excuse me. So once you're done on this screen, again, just click Save. And that should then uh, complete the models activity for you. All right, next we'll move along the bank of buttons here to the performance screen. So the performance window is where you document which NR151 performance standards were met by the implementation of this practice. So on this screen, you'll check a checkbox next to each performance standard that was met by the practice. So in our case, uh, we'll say that sheet rill and wind erosion and phosphorus index were both affected. And then you'll want to select from the drop down list here, uh, yes, indicating that that um, standard was achieved by this practice. Note that for trim grants, there is also the option at the bottom of this list to say that this practice was implemented in a location where all NR151 standards were already met, and it's a TMDL area. If that's the case, then you can select this bottom option instead of any of these standards. Otherwise, you'll be selecting standards from the list. All right, so once you've set those, go ahead and click Set. And then we will move on to the next button, which is the compliance button. So this uh, window has a couple of related pieces of information to enter. First, at the top, you will select the type of non-compliance notice that was provided prior to the implementation of this practice. So in the case of NOD grants, um, there's only one option, so you won't have to select from a dropdown. For trim grants, there are a few different options here. Um, or you can say not applicable if there was if uh, if there was not a non-compliance notice type provided prior to the implementation of the project. So for today, uh, we'll select NR151, and then in the second section here, you'll indicate that the compliance letter uh, was provided to the landowner after the implementation of the project. So that can be indicated by checking this checkbox, and then click Set to set that data. And then finally, we will move on to the last um, button here, which is the attachments button. And on the attachment screen, you can upload any supporting documentation to complete the uh, information that you're submitting for this practice. So on this window, you can select from a list of document types. 
And note that you can only upload one document at a time. So we'll start with an aerial map, uh, just as an example. You'll give a name for the document, um, just something that, that makes sense to describe what the document is. Optionally, you can give a description of uh, the file as well. And then click this browse button to browse to the file that you want to upload. Um, so in our case, I'm just going to upload a test file here, but you'll be browsing to the, the file that you wish to upload in each case. So um, you'll most likely have multiple attachments to add to each practice in the list. But note that the status is going to show up as completed after you upload just one attachment. And that's because BITS doesn't know how many attachments you'll need to have for each BMP. Um, so it just shows completed once you've uploaded at least one. But you'll still most likely need to go ahead and repeat that attachments workflow by clicking on the practice and clicking attachments, going through this screen again until you've included all documentation that you need to add. All right, so at this point, we've added all of the information we need to for this project, and now it's time to review that information. So there's a few ways that you can review what you've already submitted to BITS. First, you can just go through these buttons again to see the information you've uh, already filled out. So you could click the Edit button to look at that basic information you filled out on the Add Practice page. You can click through these buttons to see that data again that you filled out. You can also use these uh, teal tabs at the top to see a more summarized view of that information. For example, if I click the performance tab, um, it shows you which performance standards have been met and by which BMPs. The compliance tab will show just a summary of the compliance requirements that you verified. And then the attachments tab will show you all of the attachments you've uploaded for all of your, doc uh, excuse me, for all of your practices. You can even download those documents again if you need to by clicking this download button. But the best way to see all of the information you've submitted is to view the final report, which is located under this report view button. And in fact, you need to view the final report before you can submit your project. So we'll go ahead and do that now. And on this page, you'll see a printable or savable PDF style uh, report. So if I kind of scroll through here slowly, you'll see that the grant information that we filled out at the beginning is populated at the top. We've then got some summarized information about the overall load reduction and cost for the whole project. So if I had added multiple BMPs, you would see the, the sum of all of that data here. And then it breaks it down by site um, and then shows you the uh, specific information about each BMP that was implemented at each site, as well as all of the additional information you've added to the BMPs here. So at the bottom, there's also this grantee certification section. And this is where the name of that authorized signatory will show up as a signature on the final report. Now, we haven't actually signed this yet, so you don't see a signature here. But once you complete the certification uh, step, then the signature will show up here. So you can uh, save this off for your records if you wish by clicking the Save button. You can save in a few different formats here. You can also print. And you can also come back and uh, view this at any time, even after you've submitted your project. So then you'll click the back button once you've finished looking at this report to go back to your project page. And now it's time to certify and submit. So you'll see that once you've finished uh, viewing the report and completing all your practices, this certify menu now appears. So you can click this blue plus button to get to the signature add uh, window. So I'll click add. And this is where the authorized signatory is going to need to sign off. So if you're not the authorized signatory, you'll need to work with that person to sign off on this screen. And because the person who created the project is the only one who can edit it, um, you'll either need to have the authorized signatory come over and type into your window, or just work with them to make sure that they sign off before entering their name here. So I will um, say that you know I've worked with Margaret. She signs off on this project. Uh, enter her title, and oops, and the date that she's certifying it, and then click Certify. So at this point, uh, you're authorized. Oh, I must have spelled that wrong. 
there we go. Uh, you'll notice that the name has to actually exactly match what you entered for the authorized signatory. So the project has now been certified, but it hasn't yet been submitted. So there's one more step to do. Um, you might have to refresh the page, um, which I need to do because sometimes it takes a second to load that submit button. You might just have to refresh again here at this point, but it should show up now under the certify menu. Yep, so the submit button is where you actually go to submit your project to the DNR. So once you click submit, you'll get this pop-up window that um, asks you if you're sure you really wanna submit. And that's because once you submit the project, you won't be able to edit it again until the regional coordinator reviews the project. So um, once you're ready, go ahead and click submit. And at this point, you are finished with documenting your project until it goes to the regional coordinator for review. So I will jump back to my slides here. So at this point, the report has been sent off to the regional coordinator and they will receive an email notification when your TRIM or NOD report has been submitted. Then, they'll either they'll, then they will review and they will either approve the project or they will return it to you for revisions. You'll receive an email either way, letting you know uh, what they decided. And if it's been returned for revisions, the project will be unlocked for editing so you can make any revisions that are needed. The regional coordinator will work with you to let you know what revisions are needed. When you're done with those revisions, you can click the submit button again to send it off to the regional coordinator for review, and then repeat this process until the report is approved. All right, so that is the entirety of the walkthrough section. Um, at this point, we'll have some time for questions. So, um, Kareen, I believe you're, you've been uh, handling the question and answer box. So if you want to go ahead and start asking some questions, we can get to some of those. Uh, yes, yeah, and thank you to Joanna for managing those questions oh, as they yeah. come in. We only have two questions, and actually, I think I'll take three. a crack. Oh, we have three now. Okay, excuse me. I'm toggling back and forth here between screens. Um, okay, the first question I'll take a crack at answering. Um, essentially, the, the person was asking, well, when, when do we fill this out? And um, do you do it before the practice has started, during, or after? Um, in this case, you're going to do it after the practice is installed, just like you would in filling out the PDF final report. Um, so you're essentially documenting what your project has accomplished, not what your project is planning to do. So you're capturing what your project accomplished and installed. Um, the other question is, can we import our own shapefiles? And the answer to that question is yes. And Molly is going to actually go through that um uh in the next section so stay yep. tuned for that um let me just check here the additional questions will bits work with private tracking systems to make it easier to enter the information one time the answer is yes yeah and that's one of the reasons why you're going to want to stay tuned for the shapefile upload is it's going to allow for um, data transfer between your tracking systems um, and bits. Um, one of the things that in, in um, creating bits that we heard loud and clear from counties was that, you know, we recognize that, that many counties across the state have set up their own tracking systems and we wanted to make it easy to be able to transfer data uh, between systems so that you don't have to do manual data entry twice between the two, the two systems. Um, and Molly, I'll let you clarify this. Doesn't the certification of the authorized representative have to come um, from off the authorized representative computer? Um, and if you could just clarify that certification again. Yeah, sure. So it's a bit, um, it's a bit weird because the authorized signatory does need to be the person who signs off, but they will maybe not have actually access to the project if that's not the person who created the project. Um, one thing to note is uh, one of the enhancements that we have on our list to add to the system is the ability for multiple people at the same organization to edit a project. Right now, that's not possible, which is why I mentioned that the person who creates the project is the one who will be able to edit it. But in the future, we're looking to do that. Um, so with that future enhancement, the authorized signatory would be able to log into their own computer and sign off on the project. But for now, um, they'll have to work with the project contact. Um, 
like I mentioned, either you can, you know, be side by side and have them type their name into your, um, on your keyboard onto the screen, or, um, you know, make sure that they have signed off uh, and give you permission to sign off for them. Um, so the, I guess the answer to the question is actually no, it doesn't have to be coming from the authorized signatory's computer, it just has to be representative of their authorization. Yeah, and I will add to that, Molly, that, you know, in general, this is a fairly low risk issue, a low risk situation. Um, as Molly mentioned, you're going to be submitting your reimbursement. The authorized representative is going to be submitting the reimbursement request um, via the usual process, via email. Um, and so we're going to have all of your reimbursement documentation, um, and that will be coming from um, a signed, authorized, um, or via email um, you know, signature, essentially. Um, so this is a low risk situation. And um, just as long as we, you know, we have a sense that your authorized rep has, has um, given their blessing to this, um, I think it'll all be okay. All right, I'm gonna check the question status again here. Uh, Molly, this is a question for you. Can the primary editor be changed? It can. You'll need to work with me um, to do that. I'll have to change something in the database to allow someone else to edit a project. And I have done that possibly with some of you on this call um, in the case where uh, maybe someone has left your organization and you need to transfer their projects to someone else. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. It just takes a little bit of coordination with me to, to change that ownership. Those are all good questions. Yes, definitely. And thanks for clarifying, Kareen, about uh, when to submit the uh, project or when to, to fill this out. I think that's definitely a really good point. Um, this is the, the final report, meaning it's kind of the conclusion of your efforts implementing these BMPs. Exactly. That's right. Oh, another question's coming in. We're just waiting as it comes in here. Um, Okay, so um, person asks, um, for trim grants that were awarded in 21, will, will you need to submit the final report through BITS? And the answer is yes. Yes. Essentially, all active trim projects at this point in time will need to use BITS to submit their final reports. So it's good you're on the webinar. I think that's it at this point. Okay, well, if you have additional questions, feel free to keep directing those at Joanna. Um, thanks again, Joanna, for uh, collaborate or co collating those. Um, feel free to ask questions about um, things we've already been through as well. So I'll go ahead and move on to the next section, which has to do with shapefile uploads, which I think a few of you asked about. So um, as a quick bit of background, for those of you who might not be familiar with GIS too much, um, just want to talk about what a shapefile is. So a shapefile is a format for spatial data that's created in GIS software such as ArcGIS Pro or QGIS. Uh, technically, it's a collection of files. Um, so you'll see actually multiple files when you um, generate a shapefile. And I'll get to this in a bit, but that, that is actually the set of files that you will zip up and upload to bits. So why might you want to use shapefiles? And this gets to one of the questions from the Q&A session as well. So there's two main reasons. Uh, one, your organization might already use GIS software to map your conservation practices. This includes using third-party tools um, uh, that you might want to integrate with uh, BITS. So if you already have uh, your BMPs documented in GIS, that's a great reason to use shapefiles to move that data into BITS rather than having to redocument it. The second reason would be that you want to use GIS software to map your practices rather than using bits draw, uh, draw activity that I showed earlier. You might just prefer the, um, the GIS features instead of the, the bits online tool. So both cases are, are definitely valid and you're welcome to use shapefiles in those cases. And it's important to note that shapefiles allow you to upload both the spatial data and quantitative data for those practices through the use of shapefile attributes. And I'll show you um, here in a minute what that looks like. Uh, also, for the rest of this section, I will assume kind of a basic familiarity with GIS tools. I'm not going to be demonstrating the use of a GIS uh, software. I'll um, just kind of talk through the process. 
So the first thing you'll want to do if you want to use shapefiles to upload data to bits is to download the shapefile templates. Um, you can get those templates. Let me pull up the bits website. So this is the bits DNR website, which I'll also link to in these slides. The shapefile templates can be found here. So if you scroll down to the module that you want to use, I'm just going to minimize this one. We're looking at the targeted runoff management module. So if you expand this, we have here the um, links to download shapefile templates. So there's three different templates based on the type of shape that you are going to be drawing. So you'll just click on one of those and that will um, download the necessary templates. You can either use those templates um, just to draw your data or you can use the templates to um, see what attributes need to be added or changed in your existing features. Uh, one other thing to note is if you have existing features, you'll want to make sure that they're using the Wisconsin transverse Mercator projection. That is the projection that BITS uses, and unfortunately right now it doesn't have the ability to uh, transform uh, projections for you. So you'll want to make sure to do that before you upload the data into BITS. The shapefile templates already use that projection, so you won't need to worry about it if you're just downloading the shapefile templates and using those. Next, you'll draw your features, um, or if you already have them drawn, you'll move them into the correct um, set of attributes for bits. Uh, it's important to note that each feature will correspond to a practice. So um, for example, if you have a cover crop, that would be one feature, uh, assuming that's one practice in bits. And each shapefile type of those three types that you can download, the point, line, or polygon, can be used for all BMPs of that feature type. So for example, if you have multiple fields that you're documenting cover crops and residue management on, you can use one shapefile, the polygon shapefile, to represent all of those. They'll just all be separate features within that template. So once you've got your shapes drawn or uh, represented as features, you'll then fill out the attributes for each feature. And these attributes um, are in the shapefile template. You'll also find a list of them in the user manual appendix. And that user manual appendix is going to be really important for filling out these shapefiles. Um, it contains multiple tables that help you to understand what to enter in each attribute in order to represent your data in bits. There is actually only four attributes that need to be filled out in the shapefile template in order for the upload to be successful. That's the name field, the BMP code, and then the lat and long fields. The rest of the fields are optional. But if you don't fill out some of the fields, then you'll just need to populate that data manually within bits using the, um, the procedure that I demonstrated earlier. So I'm going to kind of do a mini demo here, um, just using some slides. So we'll use this example of a BMP that we want to upload into bits that we've already drawn in GIS. And this BMP is going to represent a cover crop, uh, five acres, $450. There's a performance standard that it met of uh, the phosphorus index, um, and then some additional information such as the non-compliance notice type, this phosphorus reduction, and the model used for that reduction. So using this data, the way to map this into the attributes are to use those tables in the user manual appendix. So uh, this is an example of one of the tables in the appendix. This is the BMP codes table. So this is where we're going to figure out what to enter in the uh, BMP code field uh, attribute value for the, the feature. So you'll find the BMP you want to document. So in this case, cover crop, which is highlighted in yellow. And then the BMP code is circled in teal there. That's going to be R5. So that R5 is what you'll enter in the BMP code field. So here's the set of attributes, screenshots taken from QGIS. And you'll see that in that first highlighted field, I entered R5 to document that this is a cover crop. Um, and these uh, values map to specific values in bits so that bits knows what you're trying to upload. The rest of these highlighted fields are the other fields that you'll need to use those tables in the appendixes to um, cross-reference and, and put in the correct values for. Um, so once you've filled out those, you're ready to uh, upload the shapefile. So this is where you will uh, save your shape, shape files as a .zip file. So I'm just going to pull up, this is my demo set of files here. Um, so you'll just highlight all of them, right click, and send to a compressed zip folder. That generates a uh, .zip of the, the set of shapefiles files that you've generated. Um, quick note, uh, you'll want to make sure that the name of this .zip matches the name of the files within it. Bits just needs those to match up in order for the upload to succeed. Then back in our uh, project, I'm actually going to pull up a 
um, another project so we can edit it since this one's already been locked for editing. Uh, so we'll just go to this example project here. And unfortunately, it's uh, having a second to load here sometimes. Hmm. All right, technical difficulties. Well, during the Q&A session, I can try to get this to load up again to demonstrate uh, where that button is, but I've actually already shown it on the screen. Um, I'll just go back to my slides and uh, talk through it. So on the Add Practices page, um, there is that Upload Shapefile Zip button that I showed previously. You'll just go ahead and click that button uh, and browse to the .zip file that you created. Once you upload that file, um, the practices contained within the file will appear in your set of practices in the table. Once you have uploaded your shapefile, there are a few more things you'll need to do to each practice in order to complete the documentation. First, there are a couple of fields that don't get populated through the shapefile at the moment. Those are the animal units and cost share recipient fields. You may also need to adjust the cost share agreement number um, as that is actually pulls in from the name field in the shapefile. So if the name of your practice is different than the cost share agreement number, you probably want to adjust that. Um, you'll also need to add any attachments to the uh, practice because there's not a way to upload attachments along with your shapefile at the moment. And then any information that you didn't fill out in the shapefile. So if you left any uh, fields blank, then those you'll just need to go through and populate in bits uh, using the, the same method that we showed previously. But other than that, once you finish those three steps, any practices that you uploaded through Shapefile are now uh, ready to be submitted. So that's the end of the Shapefile section. Um, I'll go ahead and go into some frequently asked questions here. So the first one I wanna focus on is how does BITS define a practice? So in your project, a practice should be defined as one BMP or potentially a combination of BMPs that has its own pollutant load calculation and total cost. So for example, uh, residue management implemented on one field that has an estimated five pounds of phosphorus reduction and $800 to implement. That would be one practice. And you might have many practices on the same site, uh, the same landowner and so on. You should have one practice for each uh, pollutant load reduction that you have modeled. Uh, so for example, if you have five fields at the same site, each of them is getting a cover crop and each field was modeled separately to come up with a separate pollutant load reduction number, then that's gonna be five different practices in bits. If you happen to have five fields that were all modeled together to come up with just one pollutant load reduction number, that would just be entered as one practice in bits. Now it is preferred that you're as granular as possible with those practices. So um, when you're starting out with your project and you're modeling the pollutant load reductions, we recommend continuing to be as granular as possible. So <clears throat> ideally those five fields would each be modeled separately and they would be uh, set up as five different practices. And then in bits in that practice table, each practice is gonna be one row. So you'll see uh, each practice you enter show up as one row. And in a shapefile, a practice is one feature. So this screenshot is from QGIS, and we've got two practices here. Also worth noting that a practice can include as many shapes as you need to represent the practice. So for example, if you have livestock fencing that has been documented as one practice and you need to draw multiple lines to represent that fencing, that's totally fine. You can draw multiple shapes on the practice page to represent one feature if needed. And you can also draw multiple shapes in your GIS system for shape files if needed. All right. The next question is, how should we document annual practices? So annual practices would be um, things like cover crops that are funded for multiple years in the same location. And the way that you would wanna document these today in bits is to create one practice per year funded. So if you're funding two years of a cover crop on a field, you would document that as two practices in bits. The date installed will be different for each practice, of course, and you might even have a different total cost or some of the other values, um, but they would be in the same location uh, documented once per year. 
How does BITS accommodate multiple practices that combine pollutant load reduction calculations? So for example, if you have uh, one field on which you're implementing residue management and cover crops, and together you've estimated the pollutant load reduction at six pounds per year and $1,000 to implement. Well, there's two options for what you can do in that case. Um, first is a feature that'll be coming soon to the trim and NOD modules, which is the ability to document a combination BMP. So if a combo type exists for your combination of practices, so in this case, residue management and cover crops, you'll be able to pick from the drop-down list residue management plus cover crops, and then BITS will treat that as one practice in the system. You can then document a combined pollutant load reduction for that set of practices, which will be a combo BMP. Now, that is not available yet, unfortunately, although we are looking to implement that in the next few weeks, so um, soon you'll see that in the system. But if you're documenting your BMPs um, before that's available, or if you have a set of BMPs that isn't one of the predefined combo types, then you can, you can basically document them as multiple practices in the same location. Uh, you would then just split the load reduction between the practices, either evenly 50-50 or uh, split it according to relative weight of each practice, just so long as the total pollutant load reduction adds up to what you have um, estimated with the, the um, practices together. And if you have specific questions about your uh, situation, you can ask your regional coordinator for advice on how that should be documented. Um, you can also talk to me or any of the DNR program contacts. We can help you figure out how to, how to write that down. All right, another question is, how would you get your previous year's data into bits? So um, as I mentioned, prior to this year, the TRIM and NOD grants um, both used PDF forms to submit your final reports. And you might wanna get that historical data into bits so that you can see it in the system with the rest of your data. Well, the DNR does plan to backpopulate that data over time as uh, time and resources allow. But if you want to get your organization's data into bits sooner so that you can see that uh, along with the rest of your data, um, let me know. I'd be happy to let you help us backpopulate the data for your organization. And then finally, how can I see data that's been collected in bits um, so that I can really take advantage of the virtual format? But you can always view your own projects in the project list. So that's a menu option in bits uh, that I didn't necessarily demonstrate, but um, you basically just click uh, project list under projects at the top, and that'll show you all of the projects that you have documented. So you can always go back and see those. But if you want to see more information about what other organizations have documented and submitted, in the future, we'll have downloadable reports available that'll aggregate the statewide data for these approved reports. Um, in the meantime, as we're working on developing those, if you have a need for seeing that summarized data today, you can let me know. I can generate on the fly reports um, to pull some of that data for you if, if you've got a need for it. And this is an example of the type of report we're working on to make available for, uh, for end users to see. So this would be a summarized report uh, using a variety of filters. You can filter on, on several different things that then would summarize um, across the state the total pollutant load reduction and total cost of BMPs, and then break that information down by county and by BMP. So uh, my last section here is to leave you with a few resources. First, I wanna plug the BITS website. Um, this is the on the DNR webpage, our BITS website, and there's a ton of additional resources here. We have user manuals for all of the modules that have been released. We also have quick reference guides, which are kind of like abbreviated versions of the user manual that just have the, the steps uh, in case you've gone through the project already and just wanna make sure you're hitting all the steps. We also have tutorial videos, which are uh, essentially walkthroughs like I did this morning of the basic steps of the workflow. And we also have those shapefile templates for you to download and use as necessary. Also, this webinar and the slides will be available for you to reference later. I'll send out the slides to those of you who have registered for this webinar um, after the webinar today. And the recording will be able to be accessed at the uh, Wisconsin DNR and UW-Madison Extension YouTube channel, which is linked here. It might take a couple of weeks to get the upload completed, but that'll be accessible there for the future. Additionally, we have a couple of webinars coming up that you might be interested in. Uh, we'll be doing a multiple discharger variance or MDV uh, bits webinar series starting in two weeks. Um, there'll be two of those webinars. So please sign up for those if you have an MDV project or might be working on one in the future and want to see how bits is used for those. 
And finally, if you need further assistance, you can work with your regional non-point source coordinator. If you don't happen to know who that is, there's a way to find who that is at that link that I included on the slides. You can also always work with me uh, for technical assistance in bits. Um, I am happy to help. You can email me or call me at any point. And if you want to stay in the loop on updates to the system, major updates are going to be sent out through the Wisconsin Land and Water Listserv. So if you're on that LCD staff uh, listserv, I send out announcements like the release of a new module through that uh, avenue. Also, if you want to see more details about what we're doing in the system, I send out release notes for all development updates in the BITS Gov Delivery notification list, uh, which you can sign up for at the link that I provided. For example, I'll send out notes on bug fixes, um, minor enhancements, uh, changes to functionality, and shapefile format updates uh, through that list. So those are just a few of the many things that I've sent out so far. So uh, that is all that I have for today. And we've got definitely some time to answer some more questions. So I'll turn it back over to Karina and Joanna for any questions that have come in.